New York Times, June 22nd, 1917. Captain John O'Brien, known wherever deep sea sailors and soldiers of fortune congregate as Dynamite Johnny, died last night at Hotel America, 105 East 15th Street. Brought up in the sight of Hell's Gate, he daily associated with sailormen and wayfarers from across the seas. It is little wonder that the love of adventure was born in him. His playgrounds were the old shipyards. Dynamite Johnny became helper to his brother Peter, who ran a sailing ferry from Manhattan to Greenpoint. And during this time, he learned a crooked and treacherous channel of Hell's Gate. I was born in the old dry dock section of New York, almost on the bank of the East River. On April 20th, 1837, my parents though came from County Longford and Cavan. Manhattan was a cradle of shipyards. They were clustered all about. Amid such surroundings, a predisposition to life on the sea and a love of salt water and ships came naturally. Tapering spars crisscrossed the skyline and romance was in the air. The first thing I saw when I opened my eyes was a vessel and almost the next thing, the sea. Maybe I saw other things too, but none of them held my interest. Ships and the sea impressed my infantile mind as the most beautiful things in the world. And my opinion has never changed. A Captain Unafraid is Johnny's ghost-written autobiography. It was written in Cuba and New York at the close of his life. What drew Johnny to danger, I think it was born in him. In fact, the opening sentence of his book says, with an unbridled passion for the sea and the love of adventure which it engendered, it was inevitable that I should drift into filibustering. You know, when you read this book, um, Captain Unafraid, it, it's called The Strange Adventures of Dynamite Johnny O'Brien, and strange is, it's, it almost should be called the unbelievable adventures, because it, it really reads more like a, a, a book of fiction about a raucous fantasy character that they've just made up stories that you would follow along in a series of chapters in a, in a fantasy book. All of his adventures and expeditions had some element of danger um, to be arrested, to uh, crash on the rocks, to be blown to smithereens with the dynamite in his cargo hold. I, I never thought of him as I read and learned about him as somebody who would just be riding around in the calm waters. I don't think he was afraid of the Spanish army after him or the rocks in Hell Gate or um, the, what the sea might do with the wind and the weather and the storms and the electricity, lightning that frizzed his hair or whatever it did. That's not what he was afraid of. And I mean, everybody definitely has fear, but what wonder what he was afraid of. Whatever it was, he didn't allow that to stop him, and he went forward anyway, with or without it. Maybe he was afraid to stay home with a wife and 10 kids. That's probably <laughs> it. <laughs> Though he was born in Manhattan's congested tenements, 
Johnny's story really begins in a landlocked, lake-dappled county, a lake for each day of the year, but no sea. Before emigrating, Johnny's parents were friends, neighbours, and related to the parents of General Philip Sheridan. Sheridan, Johnny's first cousin, would become a leading figure in the American Civil War. The home Sheridan's family left behind still remains in Killing Care County Cabin. Both the Sheridan and O'Brien families left for America together on the same boat in 1831. Longford, or Ship Dock in Irish Gaelic, another landlocked county, is where Johnny's mother grew up. It's no wonder that Johnny was born in New York, and even that city was too small for him. As he said, he was destined to break free out of soundings and far from the worthless worries of the little hemmed-in world ashore. It's hard for me because, you know, not being a man, I can't identify with the, the inner sense that, that he would have, but I think he was a very proud man, and I think he was, he felt good about the things that he did, and, um, and I think he got, you know, again, he had that sense that he was as good as anybody or as big as any man. And, um, and he didn't, you know, he didn't tolerate bullshit. And he was very direct. Um, I mean, he played cat and mouse, of course, with all these adventures that he had, hiding and dodging and, and stuff. But I think, I think he was very self-confident. And he, I mean, he started so young to develop skills that were so crucial to what he was doing. Just growing up with ships and boats, it's like brainwashing, really. He got kind of uh, enamored of all things nautical. And, uh, and the tugboats, of course, in New York Harbor, there were a lot of them, and they were known as the Irish Navy. The tug companies were started by Irish immigrants. The Irish were really uh, in the harbor, and, uh, and he was just very good at it when he, he became a really good pilot. So you got the East River coming in here, you got the Harlem River coming in here, and you got the East River coming in here. All different tides. So this whole thing forms a giant whirlpool with very heavy currents and it's all rock ledges. So it tries to push you into the rock ledges. So many, many, many vessels have been sunk here uh, by the rocks. The Slocum in 1909, she went down with a, and lost a th thousand people, 1,031 people. They were coming up, they were trying to run and he was on fire. He, he got out of Hellgate, came up here, and he, he beached it here on Brothers Island. But the, it, it, the currents were so bad, anybody went in the water drowned. We just went from uh, five feet of water to uh, uh, 35 feet of water. So we're in, the, we're in the East River now. The pilots were able to read the currents where the other guys weren't. And so they, they could have the current help them push it around. They'd catch it just right. Unexperienced people would get caught by the currents and get pushed into the rocks. The pilots would ride it a certain way and then get out of it. They, they did like surfers. They, 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 they used the current to help them. But it was tremendous experience they had to be able to do that. We're going to be hitting current all the way now. And now we're, we're going to start proceeding towards Hellgate. We'll see two bridges. One bridge and then the railroad bridge here is the start of Hellgate. Almost as soon as he could walk, Johnny was trundling around the Lower East Side of Manhattan's dry dock, offering his services to whoever would have him. He learned his trade lending a hand to the shipbuilders and sailors of his neighborhood. Johnny ran away to sea at 13 and signed on as a cook aboard a fishing sloop called the Albion. He couldn't so much as boil a pot of water, but would catch codfish when no one else could. Having received his pilot's license from a maritime college in Cherry Street, soon he was piloting whatever vessels he could get his hands on through Hellgate, where he got his first nickname, Daredevil John. When and where no one else could be trusted on that rock-filled channel, Johnny piloted his vessels. A wealthy Cuban of revolutionary proclivities wanted to change the political map of Colombia and had bought 60 tons of dynamite to help him on his way. His next step was to get a captain crazy or calculated enough to transport the cargo. He got his name Dynamite Johnny O'Brien because a current ran through the vessel. He says that his own hair was crackling like a hickory fire 
uh, when he ran his hand through it. He didn't mind going down and literally tying dynamite together that was rolling around in the bottom of the boat. When it came to shipping a crew, I was forced to do some lying, which I regretted. But there seemed to be no other way out of it. If the truth were known, I couldn't have secured a crew on any terms. We loaded our cargo at the Statue of Liberty. Had our ordinance exploded at that hallowed spot, I would have been known by an altogether different name. Uh, it did not require much persuasion to induce me to take command of the expedition. There was quite enough danger about it to make it attractive, and being of Irish parentage, I was favorably disposed towards dynamite on general principles. We left New York early in the summer of 1888 and had good weather all the way down the coast. When we hit the Gulf of Mexico, our luck changed entirely, and I was about to be baptized for better or worse with the name that I would henceforth be known. Long arms of fire came at us as if they were aimed by old Jupiter himself with wholesale murder in his heart. At this moment I shook myself and took myself down to the belly of the craft where it turned out I was none too soon in my inquiry. Dynamite was under me and around me the ship's timbers screaming and groaning like 10,000 devils just out of hell. Crashing thunder, blazing lightning, and a deluge of water below, and the mighty rolling ocean above us. How it came to be that we sailed safely into Cologne Harbor, I do not know. When the crew saw the hundreds of boxes of dynamite coming out of the hole, they would have murdered me had they not been suffering considerably from heart failure. I offered no explanations and no apologies, but made a mental note not to ever tie myself or anyone else, for that matter, in such a bind again. Captain O'Brien returned to New York with an attack of Chagres fever that almost killed him. The fever is named after a tropical river that sleeks into the city of Cologne. Johnny recuperated from his illness near Sailor Snug Harbor. One newspaper account tells of him leaving the cottage he had rented on Staten Island with a fine head of black hair. When he returned a few months later, his skin was a trifle paler, but his hair was the color of chalk. No one knew the horrors of suffering which caused the transformation. Who knows how many explosive cargoes that strange white-haired man guided to a snug haven, the reporter said. Uh, Johnny uh, was quarantined up on City Island. When he uh, uh, was released, he was able to, I guess, fight off the yellow fever, which he uh, suffered from. Many patients did recover from yellow fever. It seems from the article that we were able to locate that he moved to Staten Island. It wasn't uncommon for seamen to purchase homes on Staten Island, uh, cottages that would allow them to escape the heat of the inner city. Uh, when they were in port and not out sailing, they would often come and live on the island during the summertime. This afforded them a nice rural place to live, some peace and quiet got them out of the hectic, uh, hot streets of the city and allowed them to live in fairly good comfort. Uh, Sailor Snuck Harbor, it was 
uh, brought about by a charitable organization founded from the bequeathment of a will by a man named uh, William Randall. He was a uh, pirate and privateer during the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War, what we would call a harbor pirate. He didn't go out on the big ship with the black flag and hunt down merchantmen, but what uh, harbor pirates used to do was they'd have small vessels that would pull up next to warehouses or uh, transport ships when they were in port, and they would raid the ships and steal the cargo off them. Um, during uh, the times of war, of course, with a letter of privacy, this was considered a legal act, but during regular peacetime, of course, we tend to frown upon actions like that. Johnny's own actions provoke questions as to the validity of following law just because it is the law, often to the detriment of right or common sense. It seems the law sometimes suits itself, and Johnny certainly had his own reasonings and reasons too. As he once said, any man that can't disobey an order ain't worth shucks, and more tellingly. Certainly it does not come with good grace from a country which prides itself on the principle that the will of the people is the law of the land, to say to its neighbors that it shall not oppose tyranny and fight with every means in their power for what they believe to be their rights. We Americans should not forget that we were rebels once ourselves and warmly welcomed filibustering aid from France in the time of the revolution. Though Johnny was involved in revolution and ruction on many's the foreign shore, it is only when he pins his sail to the mast of Cuba that he finally seems to have found his calling. Forevermore, he is intimately connected with the island republic he helped bring about. As the chapter of a captain unafraid entitled The Call of Cuba Libre begins, the summons came and was responded to in the way that distinguishes that which is preordained. Johnny once said that Cuba owes her freedom more to Jose Marti than to any other man. O'Brien's story collides with, and indeed is an integral part of, the War of Independence Marti initiated and planned from bases in New York and Florida. Though Marti died in the first skirmishes of the war, he was its guiding light and inspiration, and is considered Cuba's national hero. in the Jose Martin Memorial. This is a monument devoted to our national hero. His name is Jose Marti and he was born in the 19th century. He is the most important personality in Cuba. He was named our national hero since the very beginning of the last century. And the people named him our national hero not only because of organized the independence war, our last independence war, but also because of his value as intellectual, a philosopher. He is one of the most important writers in the Pan American letters. And he organized our last independence war against Spain that started in 1895 and it was finished three years later. He was shot fighting in the independence. He wasn't a soldier, but maybe he thought that he should be there, you know, and he, he was killed fighting his first military experience. After his death, he became the symbol of the independence, you know, the apostle of the independence of Cuba. Fue una persona que escribió de todo durante su corta trayectoria, durante su corta vida. Hizo de todo. Fue periodista, embajador, maestro, dirigente político. Y fue una persona que aportó mucho a la causa revolucionaria cubana. Gracias a Martí, quien estudió detalladamente las causas que habían conducido al fracaso en la guerra de 1868, conocida como la guerra de los 10 años, y la guerra chiquita, la causa fundamental, la falta de unidad entre los cubanos, tanto en el interior de la isla como la falta de unidad con los cubanos en el exterior. Conociendo esto, el temor de José Martí era precisamente no poder lograr, no poder llegar a todos esos cubanos que hace, trabaja intensamente da discursos políticos, crea 
una conciencia revolucionaria recupera ese sentido de pertenencia del cubano que a pesar de vivir en el exterior sentía por Cuba y gracias a esto funda el Partido Revolucionario Cubano que a lo largo de la historia cubana, valga la redundancia, se conoce como el mayor momento de unidad de nuestro proceso revolucionario. The whole country rode in behind the revolution Jose Martí had fermented over long years. Support for the necessary war came in some of its most stringent forms from some unlikely sources. For instance, cigar makers and barbers were great supporters of the War of 95. Bueno, eh, quizás eh, desde mi posición como peluquero, como barbero y la pasión que tengo con el oficio, te voy a hablar de la guerra desde los barberos, desde los peluqueros. Y en todas las guerras, especialmente en la guerra de independencia, eh, por supuesto, hubieron barberos, eh, mambices y, y, y barberos que llegaron a tener grados importantes dentro del ejército libertador. Juan Sportorno, for whom National Barber Day is named in his honor, though he didn't take part in Jose Martí's war, was president of Cuba in arms during the previous insurrection, the Ten Years' War. Hubieron varias expediciones, hubieron varias expediciones eh, de, de, o sea, que traían armas de, de los Estados Unidos porque los tabaqueros cubanos jugaban un papel importante, recaudaban fondos, el propio Martí andaba por los Estados Unidos en Tampa, y estuvieron eh, reuniendo dinero para comprar armas para traer a Cuba. Y creo que, que también en medio de, de ese momento histórico también aparece algo que hay que destacar, que es el tema del internacionalismo en la guerra de independencia. O sea, eh, ese es un caso, ejemplo de, de muchas personas de otros países, en este caso un irlandés, que estuviera involucrado, comprometido con la propia guerra de independencia en el siglo XIX, colaborara, que, que ayudara a transportar las armas de, desde Nueva York o de otro punto de Estados Unidos. Here in the Cuban Pilots Association, a plaque pays homage to Dynamite Johnny and the contribution he made to the necessary war. O'Reilly Street in Old Havana celebrates that same internationalism that Cuba still holds dear. Two island peoples in the same sea of struggle and hope, Cuba and Ireland. The adjoining street, Calle Obispo, has this tribute to Polish immigrant Carlos Roloff, one of the most important generals of the War of 95. The Cuban war effort drew people from across the globe, attracted to the good fight and a promise and attendant thrill of adventure. For Johnny's part, he said, any sort of filibustering expedition would have tempted me away from the prosaic piloting of New York, provided it offered any reasonable amount of adventure. But above and beyond my natural inclinations in that direction, my sympathies were strongly with the Cubans. So it was that Johnny took his place as the most lasting and loved of the Marines employed by the Cuban Revolutionary Party of Jose Martí. Far from Havana, in the Union of Artists and Writers of the province of Ciego de Avila, Professor Jose Quintana is writing a book about Johnny called John Dynamite, Marine Mandi. El aporte de Johnny Dinamita en esos momentos fue muy importante. Él trajo hasta donde he podido investigar 15 expediciones y en esas expediciones trajo a cuadros militares, trajo al general colombiano Abelino Rosas y a decenas de coroneles, tenientes coroneles, veteranos de la guerra anterior que tenían experiencia y se pudieron incorporar a la nueva contienda gracias al valor de Johnny que los trasladó. Por otra parte, trajo a Cuba en esas expediciones miles de fusiles, de machetes, de revólveres y, otros, y otras armas. 
además de alimentos, medicinas. Otro aspecto del aporte de Johnny, hay que verlo en, el, en que trajo internacionalistas de varios países, combatientes eh, colombianos, mexicanos, europeos, franceses, rusos, trajo combatientes rusos que desembarcaron en Pinar del Río y él trajo a varios de estos oficiales veteranos de las guerras en Europa, en América, que vinieron a Cuba, incluso norteamericanos, a transmitir esta experiencia. Este es otro aporte de Johnny Dinamita a la causa independentista de Cuba. Los españoles podían hundirlo a cañonazos y también los norteamericanos confiscarle el barco si lo capturaban en esas operaciones clandestinas hacia Cuba. Hay que destacar que Johnny fue un contrabandista en la primera etapa de su vida. Fue un rebelde sin causa. Su única causa era eh, burlar a las autoridades de los diferentes países de América Central, del Caribe, a los Estados Unidos. Cuba era, la, junto con Puerto Rico, las únicas colonias que quedaban del Imperio Español en América. Johnny no duda en dejar esa vida aventurera de contrabandista y a partir de entonces, del año 1896, Johnny O'Brien o Juanito Dinamita, como le llamaron los cubanos, fue un rebelde con causa, una sola causa, la libertad de los cubanos. Usually the Boer War is identified as a kind of the first guerrilla war fighting a colonial power. It's actually the Cubans uh, who take a model of anti-colonial insurgency, a popular insurgency with a populist base, with a social agenda, with, uh, with, with at least a rhetoric of, of democratic participation, social equality, racial equality. And so this amalgam, this, this what we can call the, the, the kind of, the, the Cuban War for Independence is not simply a war of independence to free Cuba f from political rule of a colonial power. So it's an anti-colonial struggle to be sure that summoned participants on the basis of a, of a free Cuba, uh, national sovereignty, self-determination, as Jose Martí said, you know, for all and the well-being of all. So in many ways, this is, this is an anti-colonial struggle that has a very specific political, economic, and social agenda. At the age of 61, Johnny forged a legacy for which he would forevermore be known. Having recently supplied guns and dynamite to General Soto in Honduras and General Hippolyte in Haiti, Johnny was back to his old job of ferrying cargo around the newly tamed Hellgate. The largest dynamite explosion in US history had blasted out its rocks and made the channel easy to navigate. In this tepid atmosphere, Johnny was approached by the Cuban Junta, whose plans had so often been plagued and scuttled by spies and the many crooked sea captains of New York port. When they approached Johnny, the Cubans were in sore need of a savior for their floundering New York operations. Captain O'Brien, for his part, did not need to be asked twice, and his first trip to aid the Cubans was soon underway, ferrying 2,500 rifles, a 12-pounder Hotchkiss field gun, 1,200 machetes, 1,500 revolvers, 200 short carbines, 1,000 pounds of dynamite, an abundance of ammunition, and one general, Calixto Garcia, to the island. Johnny maintained the Cubans were broke, and there was more money to be made piloting legal cargo from New York than ferrying armaments and men to Cuba. At any rate, his first expedition was a roaring success. That is, Garcia and his rebels were now encamped in the mountains of Old Oriente province, where, along with the guns Johnny had supplied, they vigorously engaged the Spanish forces. Our destination was the San Juan River, east of Cienfuegos. We had waded 12 miles out to sea. Once it was dark, we steamed at full speed for the river. There was a narrow channel running out from its mouth with dangerous shoals on both sides of it for 10 miles, which made it a difficult place to get into. 
and a much more difficult one to get away from in a hurry. Helm hard over starboard, I cried, climbing up on the wheel, which should have been handled by two strong men instead of one little Irish. We hit them right square in the middle of the deck house. As pretty a shot as Mike Walsh ever made. What follows is the libel suit filed by the US government, which led to the eventual seizure of the Three Friends. That the vessel Three Friends, to wit, December 14, 1896, within the southern district of Florida, at the port of Fernadina, was then and there by certain persons, to wit, John O'Brien, W.T. Lewis, and others, heavily laden with rifles, cartridges, machetes, dynamite, and other munitions of war and that said vessel was furnished, fitted out, and armed to be employed in the commission of piratical aggression on the high seas, on the subjects, citizens, and property of the King of Spain. Nos encontramos en lo que se conoce como la trocha militar de Júcaro Morón. El objetivo de esa trocha, por supuesto, era evitar que las fuerzas eh, del Ejército Libertador eh, cruzaran al occidente. ¿Por qué? Porque el occidente era la región más rica donde estaban los mayores recursos. Los ladrillos que se fabricaban aquí mismo en, en Ciego de Ávila pues se construía y esa trocha eh, sólida que podemos decir que es una de las construcciones militares más grandes que hizo España en, en la América. Ese no tiene valor histórico, lo que es un valor didáctico, un valor educativo. El propio Martínez Campo entonces propone que venga a Cuba un, un general que tenga la fuerza, la decisión necesaria, y yo diría no solo la fuerza y la decisión, sino que ya tenía un expediente de ser una gente eh, drástica, sanguinaria, y que podía utilizar cualquier método para lograr reducir la revolución de los cubanos. Y entonces es que él le propone que venga aquí a, como capitán general a Valeriano Güeyle Nicolau. Valeriano Güeyle Nicolau, una de las medidas que decide tomar es refortificar esta, la trocha. Y entonces es que a partir del año 96 comienza a construirse lo que hoy vemos. Güeyle arrives to Cuba in 1896 as the war expands from eastern Cuba into the West, and what is known in Cuban history as the invasion of the insurgent armies from, from the strongholds of the eastern provinces into the western tip of the island. Uh, Huela arrives to Cuba with a mandate from the Spanish government to bring an end to this uh, insurgency uh, as quickly as possible. And Huela brings to the task a, a knowledge of, of the character of guerrilla warfare. Huela is in fact, the forerunner of counterinsurgent techniques that will be used all through the 20th century uh, in fighting anti-colonial insurgencies throughout the world. So Wayla comes, arrives to Cuba with a plan, as he says, to, uh, to fight war with war and understands the necessity to relocate the, the civilian population in rural Cuba out of the countryside that had been providing support, medicine, intelligence, uh, relief into what are called reconcentration camps and effectively saying anybody who is outside of these camps are now ipso facto the enemy. The Spanish government was not prepared to house, feed, nurture, care medically for these new concentration camps. So tens of thousands of people perish in these camps. As he said in, um, in one interview that he would reduce Cuba to the flatness of the palm of his hand uh, to bring this war to an end so that anybody, including Johnny, uh, who was in any way supporting, nurturing, aiding and abetting this insurgency, was, uh, was, a, was a high target of Huela. 
Valeriano once declared he would hang Johnny from the flagpole of Cabana's fortress as a warning to any other would-be rebels. Un corresponsal de guerra le pregunta en La Habana a Valeriano Weyler que qué pensaba de Johnny Dinamita. Él se sentía muy molesto con Johnny Dinamita porque era el hombre, uno de los hombres que le traía expediciones que fortalecían al ejército libertador cubano. Y entonces él dice que en cualquier momento si lo captura lo va a ahorcar, lo va a ejecutar en el mástil del morro, de la fortaleza del morro en La Habana, como escarmiento para los demás revolucionarios cubanos. Y por suerte esto no lo pudo lograr porque Johnny Dinamita era un trépido, era un hombre incansable que siempre burlaba la persecución de los barcos españoles, tanto en el mar como de las tropas hispanas que custodiaban las costas donde él llevaba el desembarco de los hombres, de las armas y de las municiones para el ejército libertador cubano. Es un episodio que vincula a Valeriano Weyler, el cruel capitán general, con el revolucionario Johnny Dynamite. The same journalist who interviewed Weyler on a later date hands a letter of response from Johnny. In it, Captain O'Brien showers contempt on the infamous general, saying he will make a landing within plain sight of Havana on his next trip to Cuba. Johnny also says if he happens to capture the Captain General of the Spanish, he will feed him to the fires of the Dauntless. Although this never occurred, a few short months later, in May 1897, Johnny landed the Dauntless and a large cargo of munitions within three miles of the presidential palace, where Valeriano was sometime ensconced. At the cusp of victory, the Cuban struggle for freedom was overtaken by U.S. interests. On the 15th of February, 1898, the USS Maine exploded in Havana Harbor, killing 260 Marines. Though Johnny always maintained the explosion was accidental, the U.S. authorities were convinced the Spanish were the perpetrators. So began, whether by design or by accident, direct U.S. military intervention in Cuba. The U.S. had been on a long road of expansionism in the Americas that began in the drive west and continued in the push to the Pacific and south into Mexican territories. The last station on this long road was the War of 98. What Roosevelt was told was a splendid little war, was indeed a conflict that made an empire of the great Republic of the West, an empire that even in our own day, the United States of America is wholly committed to protecting. All sorts of images and metaphors are deployed to characterize Cuba's future. One is called uh, the ripe apple thesis, that Cuba, like an apple that's ripe, has no choice but to fall to earth because of, uh, of gravity, that at some indeterminate point in the future, uh, the ripe apple will, will fall and Cuba, being the ripe apple, would be incorporated into the U.S. Then this leads to what is called the law of political gravitation, which is a spin-off of this, that, that, that Cuba is too small, too weak um, uh, to stand on its own, and therefore has to be pulled in by the gravitational orbit of the United States. Al pasar el tiempo, se han hecho estudios y todo parece indicar que fue una explosión técnica, fue un accidente. Y en ese momento, los norteamericanos aprovechan ese incidente, ese hecho, para declararle la guerra a España y enviar a sus tropas, a su ejército, para participar en el conflicto de los cubanos contra los españoles. Y así comienza la guerra hispano-cubana norteamericana, que finalmente eh, se logra la derrota de, del ejército español, pero los cubanos no logran la independencia porque el país se convierte en una neocolonia de los Estados Unidos hasta el año 1959, cuando el primero de enero triunfa la revolución dirigida por Fidel Castro. The Spanish-American War inadvertently ended Johnny's long career of filibustering. He found himself settling down at the age of 61. 
Perhaps he was tired of revolution and ruction. Or maybe there was no more rebellion to be had. The US Eagle had now spread its wings firmly over the Americas, and Johnny would be hard pressed to find a theater in which to play the game of war without playing by the rules. And playing by the rules was something he was loath to do. After the war reached its conclusion, Johnny took the position of Chief Havana Harbor pilot, which was offered him by the first president of Cuba, Thomas Estrada Palma. A law was passed subsequently, which made it compulsory for Cuban pilots to be Cuban citizens. Johnny was on the point of resigning, as he would not renounce his American citizenship, but the Cubans waived the rule for him, and he continued the job with his pride restored and his patriotism intact. Years later, after the war, they raised the main up from Havana Harbor to have it towed out to sea, so I guess it wouldn't obstruct other things in the harbor. And they asked Johnny to guide it out there. Captain Dynamite Johnny O'Brien, at 75 years of age, put on his best morning suit, a starched white shirt, and bow tie, and climbed into the rusted and patched deck. He hung an American flag from a temporary mast. And when the ships reached the three-mile limit, O'Brien's crew came aboard the main and opened the valves in the bulkheads to let the water rush in as sailors on nearby ships blew mournful taps into the air. Before he left, Captain O'Brien took the edge of the flag in his hand and kissed it. As the main slipped beneath the sea, the 30,000 people marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York paused and all the church bells tolled for five minutes in a tribute to the heroes who'd gone down with the ship. When we think of Johnny's life, we can only guess at his motives. Was he really fearless? Did he serve the cause of Cuba because of some misguided addiction to danger? Or was he a true internationalist? When trying to get a proper picture of the man, we have to remember, Johnny more than anything was a sailor and a captain. His relationship with the sea is the most intangible but essential part of him. Early in life, Johnny learned wherever danger was to be found, that was where he could truly test his mettle as a mariner. As the first chapter of A Captain Unafraid attests, Johnny was drawn inexorably to the lure of troubled waters. As the 20th century rolled in and on, Johnny declared filibustering to be in the dumps. In 1904, he moves to Cuba. He makes sporadic trips back to New York, where he is often interviewed by the press who get his take on war, old age, and infamy. Any man that can't disobey an order ain't worth shucks. It seems the trouble he had courted so diligently had turned up right at his door. My crew were, were fellas as tough as pine nuts and fuller of fight than wild cats. Johnny was a very proud character and very much in control of himself and even to, to the end of his life, of his very long life. If he lived to be 80 years old in those days, it was quite a bit of longevity there. But he, he says, and so, this is at the close of the Captain Unafraid, he said, and so I am still a pilot. Piloting at Havana is as simple as transporting in New York Harbor at Slackwater, and I like the Cuban climate. 
I have no regrets and cherish no disappointments. If I have not acquired a great deal of money, I have accumulated that greater treasure, a fund of satisfactory memories. I have done the things which came to my hand in the best way I knew how, and that, after all, is ambition's best fulfillment. He was true to his calling, and he had no, no regrets, not a lot of money, but a, a treasure of um, satisfied memories. He was um, true to himself. Johnny became a Freemason at the age of 30. He was kicked out 20 years later for not paying his dues. His relationship with money seems to have been as devil may care as the rest of his life. According to Johnny's relations, a few months before his death, he burnt all his money in the fireplace of his home on Highland Avenue, Kearney, New Jersey, leaving not even a dollar for a gravestone. In his last years, we get a picture of a man ill at ease with settling down. The filibustering had passed him by, and then he took pretty much a government job. Yet a lot of the Irish, they became assimilated into the culture, and then they got good-paying jobs, steady jobs with the city. Um, it's a dream of many even to this day. And that's what he did at the end of his filibustering. He took a government job with the Cuban government, doing what he loved. Um, not filibustering, but he was still piloting ships. He was involved in seafaring activities. And then he came back home to take a, one last look at the, uh, the place where he grew up. That's a very human trait. And I'm not surprised he did that at all. And the fact that he wandered when he was here in New York, that's, that, that is an embodiment of his entire life. He was a restless soul. According to his New York Times obituary, Johnny traveled home from Cuba to see snowfall in New York's harbor once more before he died. Johnny returns to the US in the winter of 1916. Despite being confined to a wheelchair, he moves from hotel to hotel over a short few months. First he stays at the Martinique, then the McAlpin, a wanderer who no more can roam. Um, his Cuban friends never forgot what he'd done for them and every year threw him a big birthday party in New York. Um, a big banquet in, in appreciation of his aid to the Cuban people in the dark days of the insurrection. The Cubans organize a celebration for his 80th birthday in April 1917. At this stage, he is settled into a little known hotel frequented by Cubans near Union Square. Johnny died at Hotel America, 105 East 15th Street, on the morning of the 20th of June, 1917. When he died, the Spanish-American war veterans in Savannah, Georgia, a whole bunch of them came up to New York for his funeral. So he knew uh, a lot of people up and down the coast who really admired and respected him. So, so they were at his funeral too, along with the Masons and uh, the Cubans, who really loved him. His close friend, Victor Barranco, was by his side. Johnny's last words were, bury me by the sea, Victor. Dynamite Johnny was buried according to his wishes at Sailor Cemetery in Pelham Bay. His simple gravestone looks out onto the waters he sailed so often on. Once asked if he ever feared death, he replied, I never feared that imminent deadly breach. He passed over that breach in the month of June as the scorching New York summer rolled in.
Over there by the East River Where the seagulls cry and stretch their wings Shipyard boats are primed for leaving It's a long time since Johnny went a fighting In the month of April 1837 Johnny's mother, her exhausted side Held in her arms her newborn baby Johnny Dynamite O'Brien as a restless child, he prowled the dark, seeking trouble or fortune, whichever he could find. Soon learned his trade on Cherry Street, on ships. Jane and Alby, his trade he plied. Marine and Mommy, Johnny Dunham, Marine and Mommy, Johnny Dunham, Marine and Mommy, Johnny Dunham. 